Good evening. How's everyone doing? Loving the Halloween glam over here? Great. Um, feel free to scoot up. Let's get cozy and intimate, shall we? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I am not Diana Nowy, <laughs> for those who didn't know. Um, I'm Erin Cristobal. I am a curator at The Hammer, and I'm filling in for Diana, who couldn't make it tonight. Um, yeah, thank you guys for joining us tonight. I think this is going to be a really incredible panel. Um, the artist who I will be speaking with tonight and who will be presenting their work um, are really incredible. Um, and they are S Sula Bermuda Silverman, Maria Maya, and Siobhan Thomas. Um, made in LA 2023, Acts of Living, curated by Diana Nowy and Pablo Jose Ramirez, is the sixth iteration of the Hammers Biennial Exhibition, highlighting the practices of artists working throughout the greater Los Angeles area. These practices embrace the value of craft, materiality, performance, and collectivity. The biennial situates art as an expanded field of networks, queer affect, and indigenous and diasporic histories. Um, we also have another panel that will be on Tuesday, October 24th at 7.30 p.m. titled The Feminine Absurd, The Queer Body in Made in L.A. 2023 um, with Made in L.A. artists Jibs Cameron, Marcel Alcala, and Young June Kwok. So we hope that you guys will join us. Um, we also have just a ton of programs and performances um, over the next few months as the show goes on, so please feel free to come back and hang out with us. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce um, the artists on the panel. Each artist is going to speak for five to seven minutes, not 15, <laughs> about their practice. And um, once they are all done, we will have a conversation, and then we will open it up to Q&A. Um, after the event, we always have cookies and coffee outside. So if you want to hang out, chat, decompress, um, feel free to do so. So I'm gonna introduce everyone and then they will go up in order of my introduction. So Sula Bermuda Silverman received her BA in the studio art from Bard College and her MFA in sculpture from the Yale School of Art. Through a practice of thematic diversity free from any material dependency, Bermuda Silverman has crafted solo exhibitions at the California African American Museum, the University of Texas at Austin, and Project Row Houses in Houston that explore the pillars of identity and um, and history, singling her out as one of the most dynamic artists of her generation. Bermuda Silverman's multidisciplinary approach utilizes assemblage, sculpture, and videography to interrogate economic, racial, religious, and gendered systems of power. Her relationship to materials is born from an involved and expansive research process, articulating the narrative history of contributing components, both organic and synthetic. While much of her work draws on personal experiences, her objects also gesture more broadly to ideas of mutability, mutability and decay, gathering a myriad of associations to pose identity as a multifaceted, fluid notion. Chiffon Thomas's multifaceted practice incorporates embroidery, collage, drawing, and sculpture to explore the self as split, fractured, and transforming. In his work, Thomas contends with the crafted body in his work, examining wider, wider issues of gender, race, and sexuality. Thomas holds an MFA from Yale University and a BFA from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. He has also completed prominent residencies with Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, the ME and the Fount Fountainhead Residency in Miami, Florida. His work is in the permanent collections of The Hammer, um, ICA Miami, the Perez Museum in Miami, and the Courier Muse Museum of Art, um, among others. Thomas is a 2022 recipient of the Joan Mitchell Fellowship, 
PPOW presented Staircase to the Rose Window, Thomas's first solo muse museum exhibition, um, which will open in the fall. Well, I guess it's open now, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> this, man, this may be slightly outdated. Um, uh, yeah, which I guess is on view now. Um, and finally, Maria Maya is a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary artist working in sculpture, installation, performance, and sound. Through her art practice, she deepens her connection to ancestry and collective memory. Maya has exhibited or, or prefer, per, performed <laughs> at Murmurs, Los Angeles, Palm Springs Art Museum, Orange County Museum, uh, Charlie James Gallery, Edward Secchi Gallery, Museum of Contemporary Art Tucson, La Pau Gallery, and Oxy Arts Los Angeles. She was an artist in residence at the Palm Springs Art Museum in 2022. Maya's work has been featured in publication, pub, publications such as the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and Cultured Mag. Um, so yeah, that is our lovely panel for this evening. And so Sula is gonna start us off. Maria is going to start us off with a presentation. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, ooh, good. Good to see you all. Thank you guys all for coming out. Um, my name is Maria Maya. I'm a first generation Mexican and Samoan artist from Long Beach, California. I work in sculpture, sound, and film. And all my work um, is a deep... <sighs> Give me one sec. <laughs> I'm gonna take one second to just be here with all of you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, all my work is a really deep love and personal love letter to my community, to my family, and to my city. This is a image of my garden space where I source a lot of material. A lot of the work that I present um, is embedded with corn and seed. And this is my first harvest of corn during the pandemic 2020. So this is an image of me and my family actually weaving my Murmur show. Um, these are, this is my mom and my aunt, my siblings, and you know, I think of a lot of my work actually as future ancestors. I use a lot of my images of my family um, to create these portraits. Um, I see the artwork as storytellers, these dynamic beings who have the capacity to change and evolve through time. Um, a lot of my sculptural works have this capacity to change. This is a sculpture of my mother. This was in the Murmur show. Um, ah, I'm gonna take one second to just take this jacket off and be with you guys. Oh, it's also okay. All right. So I like to use materials sourced throughout my community. I like to use materials that are na uh, nature-based. Um, many of my figures are made out of a collection of concrete, rebar, natural materials, and unnatural materials found within my community and my city. Uh, seeds from my, my own personal garden, my friend's gardens, and palm fronds sourced throughout Los Angeles. So when I am working in institutional spaces, a big challenge is using these sorts of materials. Um, the conversation that comes up often are conversations about preservation and contamination, uh, which I like to think about. I imbue a lot of my works here. Like this is a piece called Tina Madre, um, which is a multi-generational art piece. It's a figurative piece that I, um, was referencing the Mayan figure of death, birth, rebirth, so a multi-layered face. It has my face, my mother's face, and my niece's face. And again, these works are imbu imbued with seed. When 
they're placed into institutional spaces, I like to think about their capacity to be archival in that, in that way. I like to think about um, also their ability to change over time. Um, palm is an essential plant species in my practice. I see palm as iconically Los Angeles. I also see it as iconically, uh, as having kind of an immigrant status. It's not from here, it's an invasive species brought into Los Angeles to become ornamental. Um, it is hyper-present here, it's omnipresent, but it's also invisible in a lot of ways, or its utility is invisible. I like to kind of center my practice around bringing visibility to its utility. So when I say that my works have the capacity to transform themselves and to change over time, a lot of the times I will use my family's face, uh, family member faces over and over, and use them as storytellers to tell different things that I'm experiencing within my own practice and within my own communities. So in this first image here, uh, this is the face of my mother and my sister. This was a in a backyard show that happened in East Los Angeles that was organized by myself and other artists. Um, it was an ode to Felix Gonzalez Torres' work, the diminishing body pieces. Um, this was also around 2018 where a lot of uh, folks of color in my community were talking about ICE and uh, immigration. And uh, several of us had begun to start visiting Adelanto, which was a detention center, which is a detention center, um, one of the largest in Southern California. And it was a conversation piece where I placed a piggy bank in space with this diminishing body. People were asked to go ahead and take the candy, but also maybe make these exchanges. And we used it as kind of a storytelling device to talk about the women we had met in Adelanto. Um, again, these pieces evolve, these faces evolve, the story evolves. Um, it was, those same faces were later used in a, in a piece that went into Oxy that was also a part of, um, it, it was called In Plain Sight, which was an activation done by Rafa Sparza and Castles. That was, um, yeah, that was a national activation with a sky writing to talk about ICE detention centers and to talk about to talk about immigration and to talk about what was going on at that time. Thank you guys for holding space for my nervousness. <laughs> Appreciate you all. Um, yeah, so again, my works evolve over time. I really appreciate that the em embedded seed is a way to kind of complicate standing in institutional spaces. I really, I really like bringing in dirt and natural materials and things that have a challenging relationship to museums and galleries. I think that that allows me to be in a conversation with curators and other makers in a way that like really helps me um, just kind of process what it means to bring my family into these spaces, what's to what it means to bring my family's images into these spaces. It always feels very loaded, but it also is very empowering to know that um, an artwork can complicate, can disrupt, and can also still be still in so many ways. This is, um, this is called The Jade. This is an image of my nephew. This was him at 14, um, riding a bike that was my brother's, and then, you know, this material, plant, plant material, can deteriorate over time, can change. And um, when certain aspects of the initial sculpture deteriorated, it allowed me to kind of rethink what the image could be, right? And rethink what his position was. And he grew legs during this time. You know, that's over a two year span. This is from a pop-up show that happened in downtown Los Angeles to the Orange County Museum. And I really like having to reconsider the work in those ways and rethink about my process and, and, I'll, and always stand in the presence of um, this living being, you know, uh, not this uh, stagnant thing I've made, but this person that I'm inviting into the space with me in every moment, you know. This is an early work. Um, 
at Commonwealth and Council. Again, I, I like to use natural materials. Um, it's very much about creating this mythology around myself and my family and our diaspora stories and finding ways to really embody that and present it out to the world. And also, yeah, this is an orange tree piece that eventually ended up being his body. Um, so it's, it's interesting to me to like let these natural materials also show me their durability, show me their resistance um, and their capacity to continue. You know, that's, this is through a five, like four or five year span that this piece has been multiple things. Um, I also like to bring plants into spaces, and I like to see how plants evolve. Um, this was at Murmurs, and a conversation I was having a lot with the curator at the time, uh, Morgan, was about uprooting this plant that was actually, it's an image of another nephew of mine, um, and we were talking about root shock a lot at that moment. Um, and we unearthed this plant from my yard space and brought it into the gallery and allowed it to evolve there. And there was death, but there was also kind of this rebirthing of itself. It's seeded and it spread all over the gallery and people collected it. And that was also an interesting exchange with audience. And I like that plants can offer that. Um, and also I just really enjoy uh, the amount of surrender you have to have when working with live material and natural material, I think that that's a really, yeah, that's just a really interesting thing to be an observer and a witness as opposed to always uh, making and constructing. Um, I work with palm a lot. I source this palm from all over the city. I like to think of the palm as also a mapping tool. Um, in collecting it, the palms exist all, in all sorts of states, you know, um, some very intentionally planted, some sprouting up in a parking lot. Uh, they all have their specific time in which I gathered them and which I'm, um, you know, taking this palm from this neighborhood and this palm from this neighborhood and making something together. And also a lot of the Figures, too, that are made out of palm, I weave over my own body or the bodies of others. I like to think of them as imprints or impressions. Um, I will weave my foot and then walk through my space, through my studio, through my yard, and uh, that will take a print as opposed to just a woven, as opposed to just like a woven piece. It's more of a print of that moment. I also like to use my practice to invite in my family and my community. Um, during this particular show, uh, my mom also exhibited her first art pieces, which is the centerpiece. Um, and both of the sculptures, uh, both of my primary sculptures that were built during that uh, Murmur show were, um, were collaborated, like collaboratively built with my mom and my brother, and they were both also figures within the show. Um, offering the opportunity to give my mom space to show her own work was a huge, you know, uh, win for me and for my family and also just for art making. It feels really powerful to use this medium to like also allow people their own creative agency, allow my family their own creative agency. So I've also been painting a lot on the palms. I'm really interested in the way line and uh, things morph as you move around, uh, textured objects that are painted, and we are coming to the end of this. This is me in the park, vending, worked in this industry and in the art world. Uh, the garden has really taught me to re reassess the way I use time and the way I think of time and to be on a different frame of it. This is me harvesting in the city, and yes, there we go, right? <laughs> ah, thank you.
we got some other. <laughs> if it just left. Oh, no. Some more harvesting. Oh, my gosh. Some intimate moments. <laughs> uh, runway. <laughs> and this is the installation that you can experience in the group show. Oh, man. <laughs> you get every angle. Uh, thank you, Maria, for that. That was amazing. <laughs> um, hi, thank you for being here. I'm Siobhan Thomas. Um, and yeah, I, yeah, where do I start? I, I guess a little bit about me. Um, Sometimes I feel, I feel very new to LA, but this is like, this was very much a unifying moment for me to be a part of this exhibition and <clears throat> kind of finally call this place my home and feel welcomed into it. So I'm really grateful to be amongst these artists and they're just so incredible and talented. And yeah, that, that's a little bit about me. I'm from Chicago originally and I decided to just move here during a pandemic just to kind of re craft or like reconstruct my own life and my own identity and just see what that would look like with no strings attached or like um, what would it look like for me to build friendships or build a community for myself. So yeah, um, I do a lot of collecting of material. Um, sometimes I collect materials for years. They travel with me, they've moved around with me from the East Coast, which is where I previously lived before moving to Chicago, moving to LA in 2021. Um, I was living in Connecticut and I collected a bunch of material and brought them here in a pot. And some of those materials were a lot of Bibles. I think I collected over like 200 Bibles for about three years and that's kind of what I, I work from. I like really intimate objects and like repossessing them and objects that hold histories that I don't necessarily know the like detailed narratives or journeys or how they've been handled or passed down. But the fact that they come into my possession, it means something and I try to be very nurturing to these objects, but I'm also very destructive and violent. Um, and then I try to reconfigure them to bring this element of care back in. And it's kind of been a very therapeutic process for me reconstructing my own identity. Um, so a lot of these Bibles I created to represent buildings or neighborhoods that I grew up in in Chicago. and. That's one thing that stands out to me is when I moved to a different area, I noticed the architecture immediately and how vastly different it changes from the different regions. And it kind of, it shows me this timeline of like migration or like, um, yeah, just migration through this country. And Chicago, you have like a lot of bungalow buildings or you got a lot of two flats or single family homes. You don't really have brownstones and stuff like that. You don't have like colonial style buildings. So when I moved to the East Coast for grad school, that was something that really stood out to me. And you'll see some of it in my work. But this was a, the last home that I lived in in Chicago. And I try to pay homage to that and some of my work and kind of remind myself of, although I've, I'm trying to reframe my life. I still want to remember um, just the origins of who I am. And, um, I use a lot of columns and architectural parts, and I use them in various ways. Sometimes they're uh, representations of something, and then sometimes they're very imaginative, or I think of them as having some kind of functionality 
or having a, a overall purpose that leans into the concept. When I'm developing a, a, a body of work or developing a show, um, I, use, I usually have like an overarching theme that is usually devoted to like a wanderer, like a person wandering through this subliminal space, this space of like suspension is not quite determined. So these were devices that were called metronomes that I made out of pieces of columns that I spliced up and welded together and um, used hardware to, to meld together to feel like this kind of device that you might stumble upon that feels futuristic, but also something that's like an ancient device. But And it projects sound. So sometimes the work that I make has like an activation component to it, which is, is fun for me to bring like an element of play or like some, some type of sensorial um, aspect to the viewer. I actually started with a textile background, which I primarily would do embroideries of my family photographs. And that's when I realized that fiber material is not that different from other material. So I would use thread as if it was paint. And when I realized that I could take a piece of embroidery floss and look at how it was produced, it's produced out of six very thin pieces of color thread. And you could split them up and you could change the colors to make it seem like you're mixing paint. So I would change and split up these colors of thread and mix them together as if they were, like I was creating a palette for myself. And once I realized I could do that with thread, I kind of translated that same idea to very dense materials like wood and metal. Like if I could break it down enough, I could get it to behave like something else. So these are some detailed shots. I often fragment the body. Um, yeah, dis dismember the body in different ways. So yeah, thinking about that idea with thread, I started to take these columns that were from the New England region that felt like, they felt like emblems or like something symbolic to colonialism or this thing that we're still contending with. It's contingent with time, the past, and the present, and kind of trying to address things that have been a challenge for me and my family personally, um, just economically and um, socially, and just bringing them into my world and reconfiguring them and reframing them so that I can address those histories, but they're to make them not so difficult to, I don't know, just live with, understand. I really like excavating materials and like splitting them up and really getting into the core of what they are and like what they mean to me. And I started making these towers that were symbolic to memories in my past of like different, like a, a public housing building that I grew up in that had these rose windows that I thought were really strange to have in so much economic disparity. They had this, uh, this feature in this architecture that was this circular window, which was really beautiful to me. So I think about it all the time. And this piece is in the exhibit, and you never really quite know what is the state of the body. Is it being bombarded, or is it being, is, does it have this ability to ascend? But these columns are way too heavy, so you kind of are in this space of conflict or this duality between what is the possibility or potential of the figures and the materials. And then this was, I actually was able to change the piece in this show and allow it to grow wider, which was really fun for me. So I had additional pieces that I brought with me and I was able to extend these wings of this form even um, broader and expand them. And 
I don't know. I really like that. Like you could get material to behave in different ways. You could make the you could manipulate them and like create an illusion. Like this material cannot bend, but if you angle it in a certain way, then you could create an illusion that it has this flexibility. Um, the different things with with windows and building parts, still dismembering the body, still trying to find like wholeness. Um, and what does it mean to have absence of, of the whole? I think that's more interesting to me. Embedding Bibles literally into the core of a body, um, using different things like rebar ties. That's what these bundles are. They hold buildings together when you're making a cement building. So they're really interesting to me. They feel like tissue. I feel like the body and architecture are very similar. Finding organic materials, people give me stuff all the time and I have to contend with them and figure out how I can honor that material and in a way that I don't know. Um, I recently started thinking about geodesic domes and just looking at the housing crisis um, that's happening globally actually and just thinking about these innovators that created structures <laughs> after World War II and like trying to create some kind of social solutions for society and still fusing the body with those architectural efficient structures and trying to find a commonality between them. And then tethering the body to these things that they're submitted to or like this act of submission, a body and a machine becoming one and dependent on this structure. So it's still in this, this kind of dual space. You never really know if it's ascending or if it's being like this celestial being or if it's being tethered to something that is oppressive. I think, yeah, that's it. Hi, everybody. Um, one second. Okay. I'm Sula. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I want to thank Aaron for hosting um, and also Diana and Pablo for including me in the show. Um, I'm Sula. I'm from LA. Um, and I'm going to go through. Uh, like a small selection of works from the solo shows that I've been in in the past three years. Um, so I'm going to begin with this show, which was at uh, the California African American Museum in 2020, um, which was titled Neither Fish, Flesh, Nor Fowl. Um, and for the show, I made 10 dollhouses. Um, from molds from my childhood dollhouse. And um, nine were made out of sugar and one was made out of glass. Um, so usually my work begins with an interest in following the global history of a specific item or material. And so this work began with my research into sugar, um, which became interesting to me as a symbol. Um, it's a a simple substance that we take for granted, um, but has a history that's linked to early global trade and the development of um, European empire and dominance. Um, so these works were made out of sugar glass, which is historically um, has, uh, is used in uh, theater and film as props to imitate glass. Um, which you'll see later on comes from my interest in materials and objects that sort of mimic or um, imitate or pass as one another. Um, so these works come from a show that I did in 2021, which was titled Size and Lears and Crocodile Tears. Um, and it focused on the horror genre and monsters, but um, particularly zombies. 
Um, and the show used mostly three materials, which were sugar, salt, and glass. Um, the left is uh, made out of sugar and the, is stacked on salt bricks. And then the right piece is made out of glass, um, filled with water, and then also stacked on to salt bricks. Um, so these, these ma three materials play a part in the zombie legend and, and the history of the zombie and are also um, materials that can be mistaken for one another. So um, they act as kind of physical homonyms based on their application or form. So um, with this show, I was interested in the way that the, the original legend of the Haitian zombie went from being um, a victim to becoming this uh, cannibalistic monster of Hollywood that, that we all know. Um, so from there, I started making these miniature window pieces, which were little studies into the history of the Caribbean and the conquest of the Americas. So um, using mostly historical and archival materials, um, usually with colonial histories, and particularly items of the uh, Columbian exchange, and then using resin to kind of encase these organic materials. Um, so on the left is uh, made out of parsley, and then the right is salt. Um, this one, the left, it, are made out of pearls, and the right are chili flakes. So um, I started thinking about how the Spanish and Columbus's journey prompted this exchange of not only um, people and information, but also um, food, animals, insects, plants, um, and viruses um, between continents. So um, this piece comes from a show that I did last year, which was titled Here Be Dragons, um, and these were actual window sizes. Um, the outside is made from ground red pepper, and then inside are, is tobacco, pearls, peppers, dragon fruit, um, and then the images that I use are mostly from a specific Italian naturalist who drew um, these medieval monsters that many of the explorers believed um, they would find in the New World. So um, these reports of monsters became like the basis of natural history texts and um, drawings on maps, and then which perpetuated these creatures, like the life of the creatures, um, back to Europe. And many of the men that drew these things had never um, even been, uh, like had never left Europe. So they were inventing them. Um, and this specific naturalist kind of, you know, they, they made no distinct, distinction between art and science or myth and reality in these natural history books. Um, so my most recent show was in February titled Ichthyocentaur. Um, which is a mythical hybrid being um, that's part sea animal, part human, and part horse. And um, for this show, I started to look at monsters from um, a different perspective. So trying to find historical accounts of monsters that indigenous people believed um, in during the same kind of contact period. So a myth that's told often is that when the Spanish first arrived in the Americas, the indigenous people believed that they were uh, the men on horses were one being um, a centaur. So um, this kind of uh, myth is uh, comes from this scientific narrative um, that horses were reintroduced to the Americas by Europeans after they had gone extinct in, during the Ice Age. So. Um, and they, and they say that this reintroduction was kind of a, a determining uh, factor in the success of, of European uh, colonialism. Um, but many people dispute this and say that the, horse, the horses never went extinct and that indigenous tribes have, have had them um, continuously. So um, I started to think about what separated the human and the horse and I came to the, the saddle, which is um, these pieces are cast in glass and um, I started looking at the history of the Western saddle and uh, you know, the, the way that it's kind of a result of 
influence from many different cultures. Um, so here's another, another one of those. And then finally, um, to get to the work that, that's here and made in LA. Um, so these works come from researching the history of ball and claw furniture. So, so the image of the dragon's claw gripping um, a stone or, or a pearl has been a common um, symbol in Chinese mythology for centuries and um, was intended to symbolize the emperor's sort of power or protection over um, knowledge from evil. So um, this symbol came to the attention of um, British and other European um, designers through trade um, and first came on like um, English silver in the early 18th century. Um, so these pieces are cast in aluminum and then they're coated in an iron powder. And um, the ball is blown glass and then I filled them with different materials. So the left, um, oh, I think these got switched. Um, the left is walnut staircase and then the, and, and uh, synthetic rubber and then the right is um, honey soap. Um, and there's actually um, silver like sugar tongs inside of there, but it's very hard to see. Um, and then the left one is a hair gel and a, and a glass insect. And then the right is um, synthetic rubber and um, red coral. So um, like many of my other works, um, these pieces come from um, my research into uh, like material micro histories, I guess. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, mostly, I think, <laughs> um, sorry, I'm, I don't know if I have, oh no, I don't have one more. Ooh. Sorry. Um, yeah. So these come from my my history, my interest in uh, material micro histories and um, research into um, kind of global commodities, um, and particularly, I'm interested in I guess small things, um, because like these two um, images, like I believe that small things have. Uh, large histories or can have large histories. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to welcome Maria Chiffon and Sula on stage. Thank you. Hello, hello. Hi. Um, I was, I'm so enamored by all of your practices and I think there are so many different um, connections in the work, whether it be from pulling from an autobiographical space or working with family or thinking about a history of architecture. And um, I think what is so powerful about your work is the material that you all use. And in different ways, I really liked what you said, Maria, about surrendering to material. And I often feel like with organic material that is in constant flux, or found material that, you know, is also changing even at an al you know, alchemical level. I don't know if I said that correctly. Um, that there, there is so much to consider when you all are arranging these objects and putting them together. So can you all speak to um, why you have chosen to work with material that some would call maybe difficult 
or um, fluid or evasive even. Uh, yeah. Um, well, when when Maria said that, I uh, uh, really identified with it. Um, when I did that show at CAM in 2020, uh, the show shut down two weeks after it opened because of the pandemic. So it was then closed for a whole year, and the sugar just stayed in there. Um, and so when I came back to see the show the houses had totally changed, um, especially because they were the first ones that I ever did. So each one I was kind of doing different experiments on them to see what would work. Um, so, you know, some of them collapsed. Um, some of them got like the humidity like seeped in and like they turned um, cloudy. Um, so it was something that was really difficult for me at first and then I kind of like I really was like I have to surrender to this and that's kind of how I've led my practice since then is that like I have to let the material do what it's gonna do like I can't there's no way to stop it or else I'm gonna go crazy um so that doesn't really speak to what you asked about why I use them but um I definitely identified quite a bit with what you were saying um did you keep them on display in those changes? Yeah, yeah. Um, because that's the that's the work, you know. Like it, it's. I think it speaks to like life in general. Like everything's gonna change. It's always we're we're changing all the time. Um, so like they're just kind of decaying, maybe faster than we usually see or something. Yeah. And I think Maria with you, like specifically working with plants and organic material, I mean, that's material that is growing, dying. I mean, one of the most beautiful works of yours that I witnessed was, you know, coming to see it on opening night and then three weeks later, a flower blooming from the work. And I love that there are those surprise elements to your work that bring you, really slow you br down and bring you back to geological time, you know? And the fact that like a plant is living this entire life whether humans witness it or not. And there's something very poetic about that. Well, and I think that's what I really enjoyed about what you said about the fragmented body. I think we work in similar ways where these bodies kind of have this space uh, for occupations to happen for different uh, moments to happen for different um, this porousness that people can move through that the audience can move through and for me that plants can move through that an, another life could move through and have its own stake in what the piece becomes you know um, I, I was very curious about um, yeah what you were saying about the the void spaces or this desire to be whole in some of the work too, um, or maybe not a desire to be whole, this. Yeah, I, th I think that that's essentially what is always like a desire for me to get the figure to that point, but there's always some kind of, I don't know, some type of a, a hurdle or like um, something that needs to be overcome through it, like that transformation. But I definitely, that that's kind of my interest in material too, is that like they have these like ecosystems that you, you don't really have an awareness of. And that, something about that, it speaks to me very poetically that it's not like this force that's being applied on it. It's like, it's only so much information that I can, um, extract from this thing, but it has lived its own life that um, I'm lucky to even be in its presence at that moment. Absolutely, and I think, um, you know, what was really striking to me was the series of the Bible homes and thinking about how architecture plays such a big part in 
obviously not only your practice, but your life. You were saying, you know, any new space that I go to, I'm immediately looking at the architecture and that is sort of a space that is grounding me or landing me in that space. And so I'm curious, Chiffon and Sula, um, architecture, our components of architecture seem to be critical forces in your work that speak to larger socio-political issues that are maybe happening in a particular space or over the course of time. And so can you speak about why architecture seems so prominent and tends to come up often in your work? Um. Yeah, I think um, I kind of started using architecture thinking about horror and like thinking about um, in horror films, like architecture is a huge part of horror films because um, it's kind of like this um, insidious thing where it's like literally in the walls, like usually it's like blood is coming through the walls or the house um, turns on the humans or um, things like that. So I like to use architecture kind of as, I guess, a metaphor in a lot of ways, um, as like kind of like architecture of society or something like that. Yeah, I, I also use it as kind of like a metaphor for society or like sis systems and like structure, how you maneuver bodies and spaces, how you herd people in spaces, how beliefs, principles, like morality permeates through not just the individuals that inhabit space, but they start to permeate through like spaces of worship, like institutional spaces. You know how to behave in certain environments depending on what the interior or the exterior of the architecture uh, imbues upon the, the body. So yeah, it's just, it's really interesting to me how we kind of know how to operate given a, like how do you know how to let loose or like how do you know when it's an authoritarian space or like when to, um, how, I don't know, just, just the way that we present ourselves is, it just feels very organized and it's, it's cur I'm curious about it constantly. And I think speaking of what is so interesting about all, all of your work is how it shows up in institutional spaces. And I'm sure all of you have had to sort of reckon with the fact that your work does change and it is fluid and maybe it is organic. And historically, when we think about museum spaces, you know, this, the, these sort of materials disrupt or challenge the space. And so can you speak a little bit about that? Like, are you thinking about a sort of institutional history or a desire to disrupt the sort of pristine white walls with the work and the material that you're bringing into the space? I'm, I'm very I curious. want to know. I'm well, curious about <laughs> Well, no, because I'm like, uh, yes, absolutely. I'm, I feel like the material I didn't intend for that with the material. I was making what I was making. Um, but as I've entered into institutional spaces, um, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I've enjoyed the challenge of the conversation. People have been really generous, curators and folks who have held space for my practice. Um, I, I'm really interested in how these materials can disrupt a collection and also, you know, I've been really lucky to be in spaces and work with other artists who've used soil, who've used adobe, who've used um, living material. And I've really kind of learned through also watching their practices what, what this disruption can do. Like, I, I don't know. I'm still at a very early place in my, like my work going into these institutional spaces, being at museum spaces. And um, yeah, like the first time I got to put dirt at the Orange County Museum and really have that conversation and understand what it meant to do that and how uncommon these things are. And um, 
you know, and also just getting to be in this place of what preservation is, using seed and really saying that, like, I'm giving the seed that grows in my backyard, like, in a concrete space in Echo Park, um, the capacity to sit in a collection, you know, and to live on in, like, this kind of historical way. Um, and, again, these are very personal this is very personal. This is my own seed, my own work that's coming from local grocery stores and food that I've reclaimed and regrown within my own home, you know, um, and within my friends' homes and my parents' homes. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm in a place of curiosity with it, I'm really. And then you know, also with the palm people ask how long these things can survive, if this is gonna fall apart. And we've, you know, we have baskets that have been around for a thousand years that we've found, you know, that have survived. And so I'm really curious on just having those conversations and like trying to complicate that space a little bit, being open to what that is. <laughs> yeah. I, I got an opportunity to watch Maria and Stalin. That was like, that was the first time that, I don't know, I'm just curious, like, it, I love that type of like coming in and not really knowing what's gonna happen. And like, you trying to make something site specific, but you don't really, you can't really gauge how it's gonna come out, like the end result of it. You, you had a couple test runs in a different space, but it's like, you really have to just like surrender, like control and I don't know, you kind of start to embody the work, like, want it to behave in certain ways and then it it ends up manifesting in that and i think because the material is organic it allows that kind of um i don't know like irregularity that is needed and work for you to connect with that i i believe that and i saw that malleability you gave to these columns that are not malleable, you know, that are these like old pieces of wood. Like I saw you do kind of a very, we were both kind of in a very, we were in the same room. <laughs> our, our works are sharing space. Um, yeah. But, you know, and, and hearing you talk today about how you find uh, these moments of like through lines where, you, where you're finding the, the palette, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, I saw you really actively do that, and and I feel like there's a level of play within all of our work, like the dollhouses, the saddle, mm -hmm. like that. It's there's this kind of like engagement, youthful, in, yeah, kind of youthfulness, some type of synergy, right, that right. I could feel between all of our work. Yeah, I think um, also to speak of form and the body in the work. Um, I love the way that the body or the figure or some sort of representational moment kind of flashes in the work, but it's not the entirety of the work. Like there's still sort of levels of abstraction in all of your work. And so Sula, thinking of um, the work that you presented, I'm so curious about each sort of individual object that's enclosed in those dragon claws and what those individual objects mean to you in terms of a history of colonization or a particular bug or plant or moment that changed the course of history. So can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, totally. Um, so one of them is a uh, red coral, which um, is kind of one of the only global commodities that kind of like traces its way from um, Europe to Asia rather than the other way around. Um, so it, became, it was from like the Mediterranean and went um, to China and became something that was like um, very, very precious. So a lot of these things are objects that kind of like have changed over time, like their meaning, the symbol. Um, so, you know, particularly with sugar or um, dollhouses, they're like these things that were very rarefied products that were only um, allowed for by a like elite group of people and that then became over time these like things that are in everybody's homes. Um, 
So yeah, um, there's also yeah hair gel and um, honey soap. Um, thinking about bees um, and their like huge impact on the success, um, uh, the European success here in the Americas, which is basically they brought honey, uh, bees over, honeybees over um, for honey. And they didn't realize they didn't, they hadn't discovered pollination yet. So that's basically the reason why so many um, plants and uh other forms of agriculture uh, exist here in the Americas. Um, so yeah, I could kind of like go on and on forever with each individual thing, um, but I guess it's kind of like uh, a platform for people to like um, do their own history, or, like if they want to, they don't have to, but if they are interested, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love how the works feel pristine, but also sort of fantastical and inviting. And I think, you know, what you were speaking to, the sort of horror and play, I feel like there's a lot of fantasy and play amongst all of your works. And also, I think there's like new mythologies, and as you would say, Maria, future ancestors that are being birthed through the process. So can you talk about that a little bit? Because, I mean, there's so many different people or texts that come to mind. I'm thinking a lot about Sylvia Winter, um, who, you know, an amazing scholar who's thinking through how to transcend being a human, a Western human. I'm thinking of, you know, Octavia Butler and the sort of sci-fi elements and the shape-shifting abilities of humans to morph into animals and vice versa. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to focus for a moment on like mythology and maybe how that drives your work. I'm really influenced by Octavia Butler. Just her, I love fiction. I love H.R. Geiger. Like I love that kind of aesthetic. And just her ability to build worlds kind of liberated me from always having to feel like reading was so rigid and um, not inviting. And I don't know, something just difficult to contend with for me personally, but it kind of just really opened up a lens for me to be really imaginative and think about, about this like biomorphic or like um, biomimetic type of thing, being in, in space. Like we literally build worlds for ourselves, ourselves all the time. What would it look like? I ask myself questions like, what would that look like? Like what did that world look like that she designed? in that novel or like, yeah, th those questions start to steer me towards this like, um, my own desire to build a world. And then I remember I first experienced Noah Purifoy's um, Joshua Tree, the outdoor sculpture garden. I, and that, that like really kind of invited my it, it gave language to how I was working. And things look anthropomorphic, but they're essentially just assortments of parts of just discarded material, but they can feel bodily and you kind of start to create these narratives of like purpose or like, is this like something related to like uh, Catholicism or is this something related to like, um, technology, you, I asked myself a lot of questions when I visited that site, but yeah, definitely Octavia Butler. Yeah. And for me, um, a lot of my work is kind of a discovering of mythologies, uh, as you know, my family's diaspora, a lot of histories have been lost and stories have been forgotten. Also just, um, you know, I think a lot about, um, the colonization of the, the Pacific and Samoa in particular, and you know, um, when Samoa was first kind of colonized and occupied, um, my grandfather's generation actually, um, like seventy-five percent of the adult population was actually wiped out because of influenza. 
Um, that left a whole generation, like my, my grandfather's generation as kids um, in missionary schools and without their own mythology anymore. Um, these things are kind of constantly being rediscovered in my generation and I think for people of my generation across you know, the Polynesian diaspora. And also you know, in my father's background, I'm discovering so much about Latin American mythology and Aztec culture, um, Mayan culture. And this really is kind of an unearthing space for me, like building this work building these kind of portraits. I also use them as kind of sparks to begin my own research. In my work here, um, I thought a lot, you know, I found kind of a kinship with uh, this kind of portrait of myself, which is the figure I built here. Um, but it's also, I thought a lot about Xochiquetzal, which is the goddess of weaving um, in the Aztec um, pantheon, and she is also, you know, she's the, she's one of the only young goddesses um, in the Aztec realm. And then she's also a goddess of desire and pleasure. And I thought like, oh, how kind of perfect to kind of uh, bind this with my own image and my own desire to see myself in this way. Um, so, yeah, I use a lot of this kind of figurative work to also dive into histories that I maybe didn't have access to. I also use it to like bring up these conversations within my family and within my communities of, yeah, Samoan history, Samoan legacy or legend and things that just weren't available um, in my own upbringing. And yeah, that's how myth kind of plays its role. Um, I think I sort of use mythology in a different way, um, sort of looking at the ways that others use mythology um, to maybe think about the other. So like throughout time, many cultures have kind of used monsters or other kinds of creatures um, and created mythologies around this to kind of um, demonize or maybe not even demonize, but just um, think about things that are foreign to us or to them um, to kind of create a division between people. So I think that's kind of how mythology comes up a lot in my work. Yeah, I think it's such a, um, a wide ranging entry point of mythology and just in general I think storytelling and the fact that the material that you all are using has had a life before will have a life after there's that residue of vitality that's sort of embedded in all the work and you feel that as you enter the galleries um, I think Shafan, thank you for um, bringing Noah Purifoy up and into the room. Um, as you all may know, Diana and Pablo named the show Acts of Living after a quote from Noah Purifoy. And um, I think he is such an important figure, not only to LA, but I think to the art world and was someone who was a force that brought in so many incredible artists, particularly artists of color. Um, brought their work to life. And um, I think, you know, what's interesting about Pierre Foy is that, you know, during his 60s, he was sort of fed up with the art world and moved to the desert and created his foundation as what it is now. And I love the fact that all of your work um, in some ways does what Pierre Foy was, you know, wanting to do was to challenge the institution, was to use material that may be deemed as difficult, but material that we all need to survive, um, whether it be a roof over our head, whether it be something that we're consuming, um, even like a history of sugar, and you know, um, thinking about fertility and plants, and as you mentioned, bees. Um, so much of the material that you all use are materials that keep us as humans going. And I think that's really fascinating. Um, 
So thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. We are going to open it up to uh, just a few questions, and then we're going to have some coffee and tea and cookies. So um, we have mics on either side here, so just raise your hand and um, ask away. Thank you all so much for these presentations. It's so lovely, and the resonances between all the pieces really, um, yeah, bringing those to the foray. And uh, my question was, you know, about the usefulness of like the concept of home, because um, when you all were talking about architecture and place, and that seems like it would accompany systems and thinking through the kind of fraught kinds of possibilities with architecture, home is also fraught. Um, so I wondered how useful that would be to kind of connect. And I was also thinking about, um, you know, the institutions, they have histories of encapsulating life or of trapping life, right? You think of natural history museums, you think of indigenous people that are sort of objects and, you know, within communities where these objects are imbued with life and vitality that are stolen from those spaces, right? So I wonder if that's kind of the offshoot. The easier one is like to go through home, <laughs> but the other thing was to think about life and how you're also rebelling against this kind of way of looking at the other. As, and uh, you, you know, Sula, your work is obviously commenting on that grammatology of that in a very specific way. But yeah, home and how you might think about how you're resisting, Im imbuing, or thinking about uh, embodying that differently. Thanks. I don't know. Um, yeah, the home for me, if I'm understanding, well, I, I feel very othered from my own, my home personally. So I'm constantly reconciling with things that remind me or make me aware of absence or um, lack. And I think those two could go hand in hand with desire for things that you, expectations of like domestic spaces and yeah, I I deal with the other within my own domestic, personal, um, yeah, story. So it's, I don't know, I kind of can relate to some of the stuff that like this kind of like anti-hero or like this humanizing a villain in a way uh, that you do, Sula, is something that, that that's why I like the, the, the way that I approach the home is always split. Like it's always like two-sided, like two, two versions and you need to um, be able to analyze them both and make sense of it and not victimize or blame or just looking at like the entire picture. I think for me, I, I think a lot about the landscape of the city and the way in which when I'm gathering materials, palms across the city, um, I think of the life I've lived here, this space, this city as my home. Um, but also how when I collect these materials, I literally weave the body, which is you know my truest space of home, but always fragmented, always uh, these hollow spaces or these you know places within the body where um, their collections or things that I've found, um, small items that I've collected around the city. Um, yeah, I think. It's constantly this kind of mapping in my work um, on like a macro scale within the city, but also like on this very personal bodily level. Um, and that's, yeah, my representation of home within my work, kind of cityscape to the very personal. Yeah, um, I, I think I agree with that as well in some of my work. Um, some stuff that I didn't show, but um, like a, I have a series of work that I have started in like 2012, I think, and um, 
just kind of has continued and it, it basically kind of goes with me wherever I go. So um, wherever I'm living at that moment, I'll make a quilt that basically, I call them quilts, but they're not really. Um, they're like made out of plastic and they, um, it's, it's collecting, like I'm scavenging and collecting things from wherever I'm living at that um, moment. So each one, I think I have like four and each one like are titled the, the, the year and the city that I'm living in at that time. Um, and I mean, this isn't really related to your question, but it goes back to what we were talking about earlier and you talking about collecting, um, which I think is like a huge part of all of our practices. Um, and I think like is hard f to see maybe in my work, but like I'm definitely an avid collector. Like um, I have lots of different kinds of collections of things, um, which to me also kind of, reminds me of home. Like I, I grew up around a lot of people who collected things. So that kind of became a part of my life. Um, like each one of my family members is, are kind of collectors in their own way. And um, that has definitely like informed my artistic practice, I would say. Question over here. Um, hi. Uh, so my, my own art practice is super computer-based, very digital, um, characterized by like a perceived lack of materiality. So I'm really curious about questions of like, because uh, a lot of you talked about having like such intimacy and care with your materials. So I'm curious about um, challenges around space and storage and like what happens to these pieces <laughs> like after the, after they're You don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that's why I'm, uh, I'm curious because yeah, there, there's probably so many stories around uh, what happens after the exhibit, and it's like you gotta put it somewhere. There's like you know we talked about the you talked about the housing crisis, and there's like lack of space, and and in the art world, it's like okay, well, what happens? Either the piece is always moving around, it's never settled, or the institution buys it or a rich person buys it or it decays in some cases. So yeah, just like a lot of, uh, anything you can say about, about that. <laughs> <We're both Yeah. laughs> like, I have a so lot of dry <laughs> leaves in my home. <laughs> I have a lot of palm leaves in my home. Um, also, I, I brought up that my work is kind of constantly in flux and these works transform themselves and things decay and things change. Um, and yeah, they live within my space, within my studio space, and I allow for those things to happen. Um, they'll live in my garden space and maybe things will fall apart. Um, and then they'll reassemble for the next show or for the next thing. And maybe, you know, and you talk, we talked a lot about architecture um, and you brought up a lot about the materials that, finding the kinship between building materials and the body. And I feel like I have a similar practice with the concrete and the rebar as kind of the only permanence um, within my pieces, usually a hand or a foot or a face, kind of these markers of the body. Um, but yeah, I think, again, it goes back to that surrender thing and allowing what space I have to be used um, to hold, hold this work. So again, I'm, I'm constantly surprised by the material because I've had sculptural pieces that are just palm, um, living in a yard space for now years and they have this kind of resistance and this power. And then I think about indigeneity and I think about folks who have used these plants over the course of you know, our histories um, to sustain themselves and I remember like, oh, plants are very powerful. Um, they're very resistant and resilient, even in their dry states, even in their dead states, you know? Yeah, I think that like you, you all are better accepting the fate of some of the <laughs> <laughs> works. Like I'd have, I've lost a lot of things. Things have broken in transit because I, poorly engineered them or like, and I, I, 
it hurts me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I started to get to a point where I'm like, these things need a certain level of nurturing and care as if it was something living, like a physical organ that you have to like take into consideration. So sometimes I'm like, why didn't you like, why didn't you care more to like, but then I, I had, I'm getting to a point, I don't know where I'm at with it. I'm like, <laughs> like now I'm moving into metal and like, I'm like, wow, metal is like so forgiving. Like I can literally just go at this thing with a, a power tool and it's still trying to be dense and like um, resist what is happening to it and like layers that I could like carve out of, away from it and it's still this impenetrable material. So I think that that's where I'm at is like trying to, I don't know, like I really have a respect for metal right now because it has that capacity to just take a lot of rigid and aggressive action. Um, this is like a extremely stressful question um, because I think about it every day and how much like my materials weigh me down. Like I can't really just like get up and leave. They're like in this studio space or in my home. Um, and part of it is like hard for me because I think about like the you know using waste as well like it's hard to like keep cr feeling like I'm creating waste um when yeah um to to continue making works um so yeah it's really I don't know it's really hard um sometimes like I think about just like getting rid of everything and like starting anew um, but at the same time, like Siobhan was saying, I like, there are things that I've collected for 15 years that I've taken with me from, um, like state to state, country to country, and like eventually ends up in the work like 10 years later. So it's really hard to let go of those things. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to like Marie Kondo a little bit. Okay, well, thank you all for being here. I really want to thank all of you, Siobhan, Maria, and Sula. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank our public programs team for putting these amazing events together. <laughs> And of course, the reason why we're all here is because Made in LA is an incredible show that everyone needs to see. Um, it'll be up until the first week of January, so pre please come through many times, see the work, come to the programs, and thank you all for being here. There's coffee and tea outside. Thank you.